Hello and welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, The Curse of Tolman Head. The Curse of Tolman Head is one of our Cornwall episodes, which will be gathered together into a gazetteer to be published on the blog that accompanies this podcast. The main character in this story, Earl Richard of Cornwall, is the man who goes on to become the Holy Roman Emperor basically by buying the job using money he gains from banking. In the ash can for the Cornwall material that's already been released, he gets several pages of material, but this story, the curse that leads to his undoing, is one that I hadn't heard before, so I'm collecting it for the Gazetta, and I hope you enjoy it. The text comes from Silly and Its Legends by R. Whitfeld, which was written in the 19th century. This comes from a LibriVox project that I recorded, so the reader is a slightly younger version of me. I've cropped off about the first seven minutes of my original recording, which discusses harvesting of Jewish bankers for money by Richard of Cornwall in what was probably considered a sympathetic way by a writer in Victorian England which is to say it's a bit anti-Semitic, and adds nothing to the story. At the end, the current, slightly older version of myself, will pop in with some plot hooks based on the story. As a counterpoise to his support of the Jews elsewhere, Earl Richard went to the contrary extreme at Scilly. He abetted the good fathers in their vindication of their rights, and not only suffered no man to do them wrong, but, it was whispered, allowed them on the contrary to do wrong to others, by stretching the law in their favour to the utmost. But the common people, with bated breath, murmured to each other as they went home that, of the two parties which their lord was accused of encouraging too much, they would rather have the Jew than the priest. Now, among the claims of the good fathers, there was one that gave a special dissatisfaction, even more than the exclusive right to Rex. This was a somewhat onerous poll tax, imposed indiscriminately on every person landing on the island. The principal port was then as it is now, called Old Town, but it was at that time in a state far different from its present aspect of ruin. Standing in Old Town Bay and facing the sea, you beheld, to the right, a stately church and monastic pile. In front on the left hand was a massy landing place and pier, the ruins of which are still visible, and above towered the noble castle of the Earls of Cornwall, while the whole circuit of the shore was lined with houses and edifices connected with trade. The point, however, to which my legend principally refers was a small cluster of buildings, a little in advance to the left. It consisted of a humble shrine or chapel, and a simple kind of guardhouse, across the front of which was stretched an iron chain, forming a barrier before a broad flight of steps that led upwards from the quay and gave access to the island. It was by this way that strangers first approached land. This projection was called Tolman, or Toll Man, point, the name being derived from a toll levied by the monks on every person without distinction who set foot on the shore. They held this power by a grant from a former earl, confirmed to them by Earl Richard. The revenue they derived from it was not inconsiderable and was rigidly exacted. Nor was there any one of their claims which gave such dire offence. It was not only said to be a pagan custom, in support of which assertion people showed a huge rock on the spot called Tolman, or Holstone, and affirmed that it was an object of druidical adoration, to which they made every worshipper pay toll, but it pressed most unjustly upon the very poorest class for every fisherman who left the island, though only for a few hours, to gain a little support for his family, was compelled to give his might in the way of tribute on his return. Nay, even holy palmers from the east, who were always elsewhere considered exempt from tax or charge, were forced to render the Jews ere they were permitted to proceed, this was said to be an infraction of the charter and a clear violation of that most pious and equitable status that no priest nor pilgrim ought ever under any circumstances to pay anything, the duty of the good men being solely to receive. But the monks, strong in the buckler of the faith and of Earl Richard, spoiled not only the Egyptians but their own order most pitilessly. Complaints were made, long and loud, to the Earl, who promised redress, and with some intention of granting it, for he was in sad want of a subsidy, and these allegations, if proved, would authorise him to extract a pretty heavy benevolence from the transgressors, or raise a goodly sum by way of bounty on their lands. 
It was a sunny evening in May, when a small company of pilgrims was seen on the deck of a vessel that neared the harbour of Old Town with a favourable wind. They bore down directly on the foot of the steps at Tolman Point, which, as it was then high water, they reached without difficulty. On coming alongside the broad stones that formed a base to the stairs, they sprang ashore and began to ascend. At their head was one apparently of higher rank or of superior sanctity, for he walked alone. His face was partly buried in his large cloak and partly concealed beneath his wide-brimmed hat, the deep flaps of which, hanging down, were often employed to hide the features. He passed on neither speaking nor apparently heeding anything until he reached the heavy chain, which was drawn across the way. Laying his hand upon it, he found it was fastened with a padlock. As one of the brothers was sitting in the toll house, reading, as it seemed, his book of prayers, the pilgrim, after several vain attempts to undo the chain, called to him in a firm but courteous voice to unfasten it and give him passage. It chanced that the person thus addressed was the prior, who, having sent the occupant of the place on an errand, had, during his absence, taken his post. Angry at being thus interrupted, and scarcely seeing who it was that spoke, he bade the newcomers wait a while and resumed his studies. The pilgrim, however, seemed in no mood to do as he was told. "'How now, Sir Priest?' replied he. "'You are malapert, forsooth. Open as I bid you, and let us pass. There is no toll levied on such as we.' The tone in which he spoke was stern and sharp, but the prior was an old man, hard of hearing, cold and unbending in his disposition, and too much accustomed to this kind of complaint to pay attention to it. He glanced slightly at the group, but looked down again and made no reply. He was not, however, long suffered to remain in peace. Laying his hand upon the chain, the pilgrim vaulted over and stood before the prior's seat, his form erect, eyes flashing fire, and his whole figure convulsed with passion. A prudent man would have let him go unchallenged, but the prior was spoiled by the habits of unquestioned power, which ecclesiastics of that day assumed over every rank and class. He was, besides, a proud, resolute man who had been a soldier in his youth and had ridden through a stricken field. His apathy was gone at once, rising up with considerable dignity and drawing to its full height his spare and ascetic form, he laid his hand upon the pilgrim's breast and bade him stand back. It was an evil chance that he did so. His hand had scarcely touched the palmer's chest ere the latter flung his cloak aside, raised his mailed arm, and smote the old man rudely upon the head. "'Dog of a priest, thou cowled robber!' he cried in a voice of thunder. "'Take that as a memento of Richard Plantagenet.' And the prior sank at his feet, bathed in blood, and over him stood Earl Richard, looking darkly down upon him as he lay." They raised the old man and tried to stanch the gore that welled from his temples, but in vain. The blow was given by a hand that seldom struck twice. He opened his eyes and looked upon the earl, whose hot fit was already succeeded by sorrow and remorse. Richard took the prior's hand and spoke to him kindly, but the sufferer was already almost beyond the reach of human blame or praise. He glanced at the prince and then at the castle that frowned above them. The spirit of prophecy, which is said to visit the dying, seemed to tremble on his lips. He whispered rather than said... Lord Earl, that blow has struck both thy house and thee, and word he spoke never more. The prediction was fulfilled. Earl Richard made all the amends in his power. He abolished the toll and gave to the brethren in exchange great largesses far surpassing in value what he had resumed. On the spot that had witnessed his crime, he founded a chantry where masses were said daily for the soul of the murdered man, but from that hour the Earl's affairs declined. He wasted his wealth in unprofitable enterprises and finally went down to the grave a broken, moody, miserable man. Nor did the curse fail of its accomplishment on the spot. It never prospered again. The sea gradually encroached upon the land and swallowed up field after field of fruitful ground. The stately church was injured by a storm and was rebuilt in diminished size and beauty. The castle fell to ruin. Why and wherefore no one could tell. Storms of thunder and lightning, so uncommon and silly, occurred constantly. Sailors and traders began to shun the place and believed it haunted by the ghost of the dead prior, which, it was said, was often seen at Tolman Head, exacting tribute from a spectral figure at the head of an equally unsubstantial train. At last, the usual effects of such rumours followed. Merchants first landed in a pleasant bay near at hand, called Port Crosser, and then discovered that in St. Mary's Pool, beyond there, was a safer and surer anchorage. Fishermen took thither their produce for sale. So a town was formed, by degrees, and on the hill above, a fort dedicated to the Virgin, and called Stella Mariae, or the Star of Mary, 
was afterwards built. Thus there came down upon Old Town gloom and desolation and decay. The ancient druids who worshipped there seemed to overshadow it still with their dim phantom presence. The blackness of the churchman's malediction is still resting there. The druid goddess, on Vana, the sea, gains upon it daily, and Tyrannus, the thunderer, is often heard. It seems abandoned to gloomy influences, and seen on a darksome day is a place whose melancholy is not soon shaken off. At no distant period it will be buried beneath the ocean, which will roll silently over all that remains of its former greatness, and leave only a few sublime leaves as records of its past history, with the memory of the old man's curse. And now for some plot hooks. If you are allied to Richard of Cornwall, and you had a covenant in that castle, it would be ruinous for him to bring down this curse upon himself. What has he done? I'd guess that by murdering a priest on what is technically holy ground, he's created an infernal aura, and that the sea, in which the spirit of the Lord moves, according to the Bible, is washing the infernal aura away. Is there something that your magi can do that, in the real world, Richard was incapable of accomplishing, so that he did not die a miserable, broken old man. If you can't, perhaps you need to relocate your covenant, and when you relocate your covenant, maybe it's to the new Hugh Town, which is why there's a commercial collapse in the old Hugh Town, because the Magi are secretly the economic centre of the island. In the section that was cut off at the start of this recording of a chapter from a book, it mentions that at that time Scilly was one large island. All of the smaller islands were gathered together. If you were founding a covenant on Scilly, wouldn't an inundation claiming a chunk of land, or the illusion of such an inundation, give you useful and free title to a large chunk of territory? You couldn't grab a hill by flooding although you could cut off an island that way. But it would mean that if there was a value you particularly wanted, you could just hide it under an illusion of the sea. I've mentioned in the past that House Macare, sensibly, needs several additional nexuses in its trade network. Would Scilly be a suitable nexus? When you look at its location, it's not badly situated as a central point from which to distribute material to the Hibernian, Lochlegan, Stonehenge, and perhaps Normandy tribunals. It is a little close to Confluences in Normandy, but still there are worse areas that House Mercure could find a little place out of sight to do the necessary business of the order. The chapter also notes that the Earls of Cornwall have given the right of all wreck to the various churches around the island. That means if a ship from any covenant happened to crash against the shore, you would need to recover it right sharpish, because otherwise the servants of the church would turn up to grab it. There are a couple of exceptions. One is that they can't claim whales, and the other is that they can't claim whole ships. How quickly can you repair a ship? Remember, your magic only needs to keep it together long enough for it to be assessed. If a crate washes ashore with a fine horse that you want to turn into your familiar, and the church comes to claim it, could you turn it, however briefly, into a porpoise? Tracking it afterwards, if it got out into the sea, might prove difficult. But your saga may vary.' 